Amen. Well, it's very good to be with you again this morning. We may be a little bit down on numbers, but that doesn't make any difference whatsoever, does it? The Lord is here, and we're going to share His Word together. What I want to bring to you this morning is um, something that's not a new thing. A number of uh, Bible commentators have um, looked at this particular thing, what I want to look at this morning, this particular scripture, and I'm thankful for that because I was able to uh, glean a lot from the things that they said. People who were much more qualified in scriptural things than me. But that being said, I would like this morning to uh, bring to you, in my own simplistic way, what uh, the Lord's given me this morning concerning this particular scripture. Or oh, if you have your Bibles uh, Andy, if you will turn with me to the book of Daniel and chapter 9. That's Daniel chapter 9. The title of my message this morning is God's Clock. God's Clock. If we see there from the, um, the first verse and onwards, you'll see there that it's a, a, a wonderful prayer that Daniel brings before the Lord. And I don't want to go into that in detail this morning because we simply don't have the time for it. But I would say this, it's a wonderful prayer of, of thanksgiving and supplication before God. It is a, a wonderful act of worship to the Lord. And it is worthy of its own message, but it's not going to be today. But I would say this, it shows to us the relationship that exists between worship and revelation. Now, I don't want you to hear me wrong here. <laughs> I don't want you to think that if we do the, the very thing that God created us to do, and that is to worship Him, that somehow you're going to be given a, a, a wonderful insight into future events that Daniel was given. That's not what I'm saying this morning, but it's the relationship between worship and revelation. That's what I, I want you to see. Because what Daniel was doing was putting himself in the right place. He was strategically placing himself in the right place with God. And that was to have him at the center of his being. God meant everything to Daniel. And therefore, he placed God at the center, didn't he? We read there, it says in verse 4, And I prayed to the Lord, my God, and made confession and said, O oh Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant, mercy, and those who love him, with those who keep his commandments. You see, he gave God the first place, the rightful place that belongs to him and belongs to him alone. And out of that attitude of worship came this revelation. It's clearly shown from chapter 9 and verse 20 onward. We'll just very quickly look at that. In 20 he says, Now while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sin and the sin of the people, presenting my supplication before the Lord my God. And then in the next verse, he's, God sends the man Gabriel or the angel Gabriel to Daniel. And it says this, that he came to him swiftly about the time of the evening offering. And then in 22 it says, And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. And then at the end of verse 23 it says, Therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. Do you see the link there between God's um, giving revelation because of Daniel's attitude of worship he wanted God to be all in all in his life. And it's just exactly the same with us. When we position ourselves in that way before God, God is going to speak to us. He's going to make revelations to us concerning his character, concerning who he is and what he wants to do in our lives. How he wants to change us from glory 
into glory. And it all comes about by worshipping the Lord. Because that's what he wants us to do, isn't it? You know? And it's not a case of some people think that the Lord somehow needs our worship. Believe me, he doesn't need our worship. It's all for our benefit. Because if we don't worship him, we will worship something else. And you know what? We'll just simply be getting second best. Because he's the best. And that's why he wants us to worship him. Because he has fullness of life for us. And Daniel saw it. And then in verse 24, we see what is uh, one of the most detailed accounts of prophetic timing in the whole of Scripture. Daniel's 70 weeks. This is a wonderful portion of Scripture, and I can't overemphasize the, the, the length, the breadth, the height, the depth of it. The, the capacity of this Scripture is just truly, absolutely amazing. You know, it, it just goes, it's like God has uh, squeezed into these few verses the whole of his master plan for mankind. It's just that encompassing. It goes on, doesn't it? Even into eternity, it goes on. It's just a wonderful thing. And not at least of that it presents to us the Messiah, mm. Jesus, our Lord. And it presents to us the fact that he and he alone can be Israel's Messiah. There can be no other. Because when we read this, we can't escape. Anybody who reads it cannot escape what God has put into these few verses. He must be the Messiah. Israel's a long-awaited Messiah. You know, even to this day, they wait for him, don't they, to come the first time. Many of the religious Jews, they wait for him to come the first time, not knowing that he's already been. That it's not even two messiahs, as some of them think. It is one messiah, but with two comings. He will come again, but not for the first time, as they think. It will be the second time, and he will come to put all things right. So we see wonderful things in this uh, thing, this allotment of time. It's like this, that God sets out a determined number of years. In essence, he commits himself to this. God is committing himself to this allotment of time to fulfill all of his promises. Isn't that just absolutely amazing? God gives a specific time scale for him to work out his plans and his purposes. 70 times 7, 490 years. Let's read that verse, the first part of that verse together then. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. The prophecy then, in essence, is for God's people at the time, the Jewish nation, and for the holy city of Jerusalem. But having said that, the full scope of it is for all who will come to the Lord our God. It's for all of God's people, isn't it? It's got kingdom promises with it, kingdom promises and kingdom plans and kingdom provision in this scripture for all who will come to the Lord. All those who the Lord our God will call. All those who will come and taste and see that God is good. It's for everyone. It does concern initially God's people and the holy city of Jerusalem. But out of it comes marvellous things for all God's people. Next, Daniel brings to us six things in two divisions. He splits them up in two threes, doesn't he? And let's examine them together. Let's have a look for, at these first three then. Number one, what does it say there? It says, to finish the transgression. This is not just sin in general. 
This is sin in particular. This is sin itself. This is the original sin. Adam's sin. That's what he's talking about. The sin that has infected all of mankind. The sin that has marred the whole of God's creation. Spoiled it. Put it out of sync, if you like. Made a complete mess of it, hasn't it? This is dealt with first. Making way for God's provision that he might offer his glorious salvation to every person who lives. He wants them to respond to his offer of amazing grace, doesn't he? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I prefer to say eternal life because of the implications. It's not just a life that just goes on and on, but it's a life that is full of life. It's abundant life. Eternal life is a much better term. To be redeemed, to be restored, to be brought back once again into a covenant relationship with God. This is God's plan and this is God's desire in dealing with the original sin, the sin of Adam. Number two, to make an end of sins. This is personal sins, my sin, your sin, the sins of all. It says, doesn't it, in um, the book of Romans, in chapter 3 and verse 23, it says, therefore all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no get out clause with this. We are all included in this. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is no exceptions in what the Scripture said. We all need God's salvation. We all need to experience His marvelous forgiveness. Wonderful, wonderful, isn't it? To, for, to um, experience God's uh, forgiveness. To make an end of means a culmination. To bring about a definite outcome. And Jesus did exactly this, didn't he? On the cross at Calvary. He paid the price for all of sin. That burden of sin was placed upon him. Isaiah in his glorious chapter 53 of the book of Isaiah tells us, don't he, in verse 6, that the Lord has laid on him the iniquity or the sin of us all. He paid the price. He paid the price in full for sin on the cross at Calvary. Number three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Colossians chapter 1 and verses 19 and 20 tell us this. To reconcile all things to himself. Elsewhere, the apostle said as well, didn't he, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And then back to Colossians, he has made peace through the blood of his cross. Iniquity conveys that which is twisted. It's twisted round, isn't it? It's perverted. It's out of shape. And that's why exactly what it's done to us. It's pulled us out of shape. We are not what God wants us to be. We are not where God wants us to be. But He is working that good work within our hearts and our lives, isn't He? You know, we have been twisted, perverting, and because of this, we continue to sin. Our sinful nature, it rises up every day, if we're honest, doesn't it? It's at war in our members. This sinful body of flesh that we still have. Our redemption is not yet complete. But praise God, He's working on us. We are a work in progress this morning. And God is doing a good work in our hearts and our lives. And because of this, through repentance, Jesus made it possible through repentance for our ongoing sins to be forgiven. We read, don't we, in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, <coughs> if we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is what Jesus does. This is what he perfected on the cross at Calvary. Our perfect Passover lamb dealt with sin once and for all. He paid the price, the ultimate price on Calvary for sin. Praise God. And uh, as we were singing today, uh, at the end of the, the first song that we, we sang this morning, the next one there was a, a, a hymn that I've been thinking of this morning uh, as I was looking through my word again. And it's that, that hymn by Philip Bliss. And it's a wonderful thing. That glorious line. No wonder he said it. Hallelujah. What a saviour. What a saviour he is this morning. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus. He dealt with what I like to call the three P's of sin. He dealt with the presence, the power, and the penalty of sin. He completely and totally dealt with it at Calvary. What Jesus did was all about potential. I want you to see that this morning because it's very much in line with the message that I want to bring with you. I want to, and this is not just a new covenant thing, I want to use two scriptures this morning that um, actually uh, point out or illustrate what I'm trying to say to you this morning. The first one is from the book of Ex um, yeah, Exodus and chapter 20. And I'm reading from verse 18. We're not going to spend too long a time on this, but it's just to illustrate what I'm trying to get across to you about this whole thing about potential. You know that the, um, the children of Israel had received the law, they'd received the, the Torah there on Mount Sinai. And then it goes on to say this in verse 18. It says, Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the chauffeurs as they sounded, and the mountain smoking. And when their people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, You speak with, with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. Why would they say such a thing? Well, it's because they had met with a just and holy God, one in absolute purity. And they had seen themselves for who they were, lost and undone, lost in sin. And they had this fear, didn't they? And there's nothing wrong with fear, but God didn't want them to have a cringing, cowering fear. He wanted to, them to have a fear that was in total reverence with himself. That's what the fear that God wanted them to experience. Let's read on. It says this. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, The first thing that he said is totally against just exactly what I was saying, what they were doing. Moses said, do not fear. He didn't want them to have that cringing, cowering fear. He says, for God has come to test you. He's come among them. He wanted to see who would align themselves with God. Who wanted to really serve the purposes of God? Who wanted to be in this right place with God himself? That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to sanctify them, to set them apart, for them to test themselves and see, did they really want to walk with God? Did they want to really serve the Lord God Almighty? And then it goes on to say, doesn't it, about the fear, and that his fear may be before you. His fear may be before you. 
this reverential fear, this fear that brings about an awareness of God, of His laws, of His judgments, of the way that He deals with us, that leads us, guides us, provides light for our path. That's what it's saying. That's what it's all about. What does this sound like? Walking in the light. Walking in the Spirit. That's what it sounds like. That's what the reverential fear of God is, being guided by God's Holy Spirit. That's what it's all about. And then it says this. So that you may not sin. On that day, God wanted to do wonderful business with his people. He wanted to bring them into a new relationship, newness of life, so that God's fear would always be before him, that God would be leading them every step of the way, and that they would sin no more. He wanted them to come in newness of life that day. He wanted to change the whole outlook of their life to bring them into what we know as a new covenant reality. The potential was there. I want to tell you that the earl was charged with potential that day, that they could have walked into newness of life with God. That's what he was offering them to them. And you know what? They chose not to have it. They said, we don't want you, but we'll try to live by your laws. And you all know that you can't live by the law and be justified. But that's simply what they tried to do. And then the second scripture is from the New Testament. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. We read the, For this end we both labor and suffer reproach, Because we trust in the living God, and that's always going to happen, brothers and sisters. And then it goes on to say this, doesn't it? And here again is the wonderful potential. Who is the Savior of all men? No exceptions. He is the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. You see, the potential exists all men and that includes everything it's not just simply talking about men though it's talking about mankind for the whole of mankind to come under God's umbrella of salvation be washed in that precious blood do you see the wonderful potential that Jesus did at Calvary It's an encompassing thing, isn't it? And it's just the same thing that God presented to the children of Israel as well. He presented to them this wonderful potential that day for their lives. The prophecy that God gave Daniel via the angel Gabriel was one of great potential. I'm sure that you can agree with that, with me this morning. The first three in this list were fulfilled entirely by Jesus. Those three that we looked at, they have been fulfilled entirely by Jesus. He and he alone could do that. No one else was able to do it. It's like when John saw about the, that that he was upset, wasn't he? Because no one was worthy to, to unloose the seals. But the lion of the tribe of Judah was. And our Jesus was able to do those things. He fulfilled each and every one of those first three things. And in so doing, he opened up the way for the next three. Let's just quickly look at that. In um, verse 24 of Daniel chapter 9, the next three, it says, "...to bring in everlasting righteousness." What is this? What is he talking about? Brothers and sisters, this is the kingdom. This is the kingdom of God established on earth. This is what it's saying here, to bring in everlasting righteousness. 
says that one day, doesn't he, the prophet says that God's glory will encompass all of the world as the waters cover the sea. That's God's kingdom. That's what he's about. That's what he's establishing. That's what he wants to do. Next one. To seal up vision and prophecy. There will be no more need for visions and prophecies because it will all be accomplished. God will have established his kingdom here on earth. He will have done it, brothers and sisters. There will be no more need for it. And then the third one. To anoint the most holy. This is the cleansing of the temple so that he can ruin on the temple forever and ever. He will bring about the full result of that scripture that says that there will be one who sits upon the throne of David forever and forever in God's kingdom. You see, but the potential was there when he did those first three things. I want you to see that. Just like the potential was there for the children of Israel in the wilderness, but they chose not to do it. God asked them if they wanted to do that that day, and they chose not to do it. It was their choice. It's just the same as salvation, isn't it? It's our choice. God says, doesn't he, Behold, today I set before you life and death. And then he goes on to say, Choose life. That's what God wants for you. He wants you to choose life. But he sets it before you. It's our choice, isn't it? And just like their choice. And Jesus made the potential for these other three things to come. But they were completely and totally dependent upon Israel's acceptance of the Messiah. Even though all six had to be accomplished by God himself. No one could do it, only God. All six of them had to be accomplished by God. But the last three were dependent upon Israel's acceptance of the Messiah. It lay with them. The potential was there, but it lay with them. Many times Jesus would speak about the kingdom, wouldn't he? He preached the gospel of the kingdom. He said many times, didn't he, the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is at hand. Sometimes he even said, the kingdom of God is within you. He said much about the kingdom. And God's desire for the kingdom to come and its full potential was there after Jesus' death and glorious resurrection. When God set his seal upon what his son had done at Calvary. When he rose again from the dead, when he conquered death. The potential for God's kingdom was there. When we read in verse 25... In um, <clears throat> Daniel chapter 9. Know therefore and understand. Vital importance. Know therefore and understand. There are many different um, interpretations of this, aren't there? Let's just read it together. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. This restoration is spoken to us three times in the Scripture, three separate occasions. Now we don't know which one began this thing. And I don't want to get tied up with um, dates and times and all. The Lord tells us not to do these things. That's not what's important. What, Im what is important, brothers and sisters, is that God's clock is always right. God's timing is absolutely impeccable. And I can assure you that whenever it was of those three restorations at Jerusalem, 
whichever one it was, 490 years later, God fulfilled his wonderful promises that the Messiah had come and he dealt with sin. He'd paid the price for sin, opening up the way for God's kingdom. He had done it in a marvelous, marvelous way. Whatever people think about the start of it, that's not the thing that's important. It's all about God's clock being right. From the, se from the restoration, seven weeks and 62 weeks, it says. Seven years and 483 years. Daniel's 70 weeks, 490 years. And to be absolutely and completely accurate, this length of time, it's like having a piece of wood that you cut to a certain length. Once you've cut it, that's it. You've committed yourself, haven't you? And that's exactly what God did. And it had to run its full length. And I want to tell you, or say to you this morning, that I believe with all my heart that God in His Son fulfilled that prophecy. He made the potential for God's kingdom to come. It only didn't because Israel rejected what God had done through His Son, the Messiah. We have to see that it has to run in full. In verse 26, we see uh, what's a kind of a dichotomy, don't we? And, uh, and this confuses a, an awful lot of people. It says this, And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Obviously, this is speaking about the crucifixion, and that he will do it for all people, not just simply for himself. It's talking about the crucifixion. But uh, it seems that there's, there's a, a pause, doesn't it? That, that it's come to a, an end. That it hasn't run its full length. Seems to be a pause there. That seven weeks has disappeared. But a close reading reveals otherwise. It says, after the 62 weeks. In fact, seven weeks after that because it did run the whole length, because Jesus did everything that was necessary to bring about God's kingdom. It didn't have an interruption in that sense, that somehow some people seem to think that, oh, it, it's, got, it's gone wrong. Uh, what's happened to plan A? I need plan B now. That's not what happened at all. It's obvious from verse 26 that God knew about all those things. It says, After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And then it goes on to give a, a description about things that were going to happen in the future. And you well know that these things have been worked out. Jesus himself spoke of them, didn't he? about when the Romans would come and that they would destroy the city of Jerusalem. That was born out in AD 70. It actually happened. Seven weeks in two parts. Three and a half years of John the Baptist. Three and a half years of Jesus. These two together represent seven years of God's grace and his favour. I want to read to you another scripture. This is from Matthew <clears throat> chapter 17 and verse 10. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Why did they say that? Well, this is, points to a twofold thing. This is the two sevens. That's what it's done. See, the, the potential for Elijah himself to come was absolutely there. But because of God's foreknowledge, he knew that they would reject his son as Messiah. And so he sent John 
in the spirit of Elijah instead. It's not plan B. It's always been plan A. But God in his foreknowledge knew what would happen and so he pictured it to be this way. You see, it's all about that they rejected the Messiah. God knew that they would do that. Elijah will come, but he'll come later. He is one of the two witnesses that we read of in Revelation chapter 11. Elijah will come one day. This seven years with two fulfillments, just exactly what the scripture says, what has been will be again. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 9. That's what will happen. And I want to um, use another scripture from Genesis this time, from uh, chapter 41 and uh, verses 18 to 20. We don't need to go all through it, but if you look there, you'll see that it's all about Pharaoh's dream. And Joseph interpreted it for him, didn't he? And Pharaoh saw seven well-fed cows coming up into the meadow, out of the water and into the meadow. And then afterwards, he saw three, uh, seven others that came up and they devoured the, the first seven. And they were still lean and gaunt and ugly, the scripture says. This is seven years of God's grace and favour. And then seven years of famine, which always speaks of God's judgment. This exactly in line with what God is presenting to us here. There will be seven years of God's grace and favour, and there will be seven years of of God's judgment to follow after simply because of Israel's rejection. They will be exactly the same thing. These seven years will be repeated. So we see seven years then, John and Jesus, and seven years that are to come yet of the two witnesses and the Antichrist. This rerun of the seven years will also be very different in that it, <coughs> it will be the time of Jacob's trouble. Excuse me. Get, <coughs> getting a bit dry today. It will be a time of Jacob's trouble. Jesus spoke of it, didn't he? He said it's going to be a time that has never been before nor never shall be again. It's going to be a terrible time for God's people. But you see, it's all about Israel's rejection. It's all about the rejection of the Messiah. What we see is God's perfect plan running its full course, right to the point of that um, provision for the kingdom to come. He dealt with everything that needed to be done. He had um, with it the full potential to do all that God had said, all that God needed to do. Jesus did all that was needed. And it's clear, isn't it, like I said, from verse 26, that Israel's rejection brought about this that God couldn't do at that time what was possible to do, i.e. to bring the kingdom. He couldn't do it because of Israel's rejection. What happened then, brothers and sisters, and I believe this with all my heart, is that God stopped Israel's clock and he rewound it seven years. And what we have is an undeterminate time in between what we call the age of grace, don't we? We call it the times of the Gentiles, when God is gathering the Gentile nations. But there is coming a day when that clock will begin to run again. 
And that's the times that we call the last days, isn't it? Israel's clock, again, will start again one day. Although it will be a terrible time for them, they will have to go through a terrible time, far worse than anything that even happened in the Holocaust, unfortunately. It will be like nothing that has ever been before. And yet out of it, they will experience God's grace. God is giving, or will give to Israel, a second chance. And this time, they will accept Him. Glory to God. God will bring about His kingdom at that time, simply because they will accept Him. They will do what Jesus spoke about in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 39. He said this, For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Baruch haba Bashem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When one day when all the world stands against them, when all seems lost, they will cry out those very words, Baruch haba Bashem Adonai. And the Messiah will come and they will look upon the one whom they have pierced. They'll see that he was the Messiah all along. And God will do a great work. The Apostle Paul spoke of it, didn't he? In the book of Romans. He said, well, even because of Israel's rejection, what a wonderful thing that was for the church and the beginning of the church. And we see that marvelously worked out, don't we? He said, but what will their acceptance be? Hallelujah, I'm looking forward to that. I don't know about you. I'm looking forward to Israel accepting their Messiah and what God has got in store for us. No eye has seen, no ear has heard the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. Hallelujah, the Lord bless you.